Thank you for that lovely welcome, and it's great to be here. I didn't know you needed a ski jacket for Santa Barbara, and I'm really sorry to be benefiting from procrastination, those of you who are here, because you have to start a paper tomorrow, not tonight. Um, thank you, um, Kathy and, um, and Dr. Jarrett and uh, Dr. DeVos for, De Boy for bringing me here today. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, so, surviving negative emotions in a time of augmentation and polarization is, uh, as you could tell from the, the lovely introduction for which, thank you very much, uh, it comes straight from the book I'm working on currently. And the material that I'm going to talk to you about tonight is straight from that book too. Um, hopefully you will see why I'm talking about negative emotions, but feel free to, to question me at the end, nay, bully me at the end, if I don't explain properly why I feel it to be um, a really important topic at the moment. Okay, so the CAPS Center um, is a center for um, ethics in public life, which is a wonderful thing to have, and there's no more important voice than your age group right now in that question. Um, you might wonder what emotions have to do with ethics. Um, in general, I think it, just at an intuitive level, it's clear that our own and others' emotional well-being is tied up with how ethical we are or are perceived as being and how ethical society is and is perceived as being. Um, it would take lifetimes of work, indeed it has taken many people lifetimes of work, to examine the relations between emotions and ethics. Um, taking class, race, gender, religion, let alone differences in time and different national contexts into account. Um, all, that I need, all that I want you to hang on to for tonight is this general sense that feeling good and doing good are yoked together. And in the mother country where I come from, we sometimes like to talk about America as that place where people came to do good and ended up feeling good. Um, so we, we think of America as having a really special relation to the yoking together of those two things. But by feeling good, obviously, I'm talking about um, emotional well-being and positive emotions. And by doing good, I'm appealing to some sense of ethics. Okay. So there's three main kind of pillars to my talk tonight um, that I hope that will, that will carry us through in the terms of the argumentative structure. The first is that the social study of emotions really matters, and really matters at the moment. I, th I, I believe it really matters in general, but I think it really matters at the moment. Um, second of all, you hear a lot about people feeling really bad, but you mostly hear analytic work about positive emotions. I think we need to spend more time thinking about and doing analytic work around negative emotions, um, and I think they really matter for public ethics. Um, and then third, I'm going to argue that um, technology and biomedicine are intimately wrapped up right now with negative emotions, both in, in terms of some ways we might move through and past some of the problems we're facing at the moment, but also in terms of how we got there, the particular version that we're suffering from at the moment, and um, ways in which it could get off an awful lot worse before it gets better if we're not really attentive. Okay, so that QED, that means that ethics in public life requires investigating these areas. Okay, so what do we know about emotions? Um, well, uh, we know a lot about emotions because people study them from every single discipline. Um, we know they're physiological, we know they're psychological, um, and we know they're also social. Um, the kinds of things that people mean when they say emotions are social is that they're contagious. Different cultures, different religions specialize in different emotions. Um, people tend to feel the way others feel. If somebody's a downer on Facebook, you've all seen that, favorite, that famous study. Everyone else starts posting negative things. If someone posts lots and lots of puppies and nice stuff, everyone else does too. Um, they're also, they're experienced. They have that sort of indexical quality that they're, they're, they're here and now. But we also constantly attribute them to others and attribute them to ourselves. Um, and not only are they experienced in the, in the moment in that indexical sense, but we revise them subsequently. So we have entire fields, like certain, certain kinds of therapy, where we change the emotion we had at the time. We, we come up with a different account of what it was we were really feeling. Um, lots of us spend much of our unfree time talking about what we really felt when such and such a thing happened or why we really feel so bad or what underlies something. So there's something that we experience in the here and now, but they're also 
incredibly subject to revision. We, give them, we do that to ourselves and we do it to others. And they're also subject to projection. So they structure a lot of, our, of our, what we want to do next, where we want to go. How many people in the audience have like the five-year plan? Come on. Some of you in your de deepest, darkest moments? No, absolutely not. OK, well. Well, anyway, some of us old folks. No, I mean that. Actually, that's actually so healthy. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, but we, but they structure. They're, they're things like, you know, how do I want to feel? What do I want to have in five years and ten years? How do I want to be feeling? I want to be a better person. Or even if I don't want to be, I want to be wealthy. Or I want to do do something really. Re I want to be really good at something. We we wrap. And they're really essential to how we talk and think about what we want for the world and what we want for ourselves in the future. Even though they have this kind of experiential um, part that's not, not, not a remainder, it's not optional, it's a necessary part of the quality of emotions. Okay, so how emotions are studied, and I don't want us to get hung up on this, although I'm totally open to questions about any of this, thus varies tremendously by the discipline that the researcher is in. So if you're a scientist in, in the life sciences, you're going to be looking at certain kinds of things. If you're um, a scientist in biophysics, you might be looking at totally different kinds of things. If you're an engineer, you might be looking at totally different kinds of things. A practitioner, somebody doing um, psychological treatments, an everyday person, a faculty member, a student just trying to get through the exam. Um, how you think about what emotions are really, really matters. The era you're living in, the country that the emotions are investigated in, and then really often the political or social problem that you're investigating is really important. So if you're trying to understand how to get more democracy or bring about or decrease inequality or something, the way that you attend to and study emotions, like the way that you attend to and study everything else, tends to be very relative to the problem at hand. Okay. So this means that researchers disagree about and ah, oh, we often just think each other are wrong, but gosh, no, we're just we're just doing it differently because we're doing something different. But that means that researchers often disagree about whether and where emotions are in the body. So for some people, the fact that emotions are in the body or aren't is really irrelevant. For some, they're really focused on the social dynamics of it. For some, they're really focused on what the, the for example, a, a model of uh, mental states or a model, a, a neuroscientist's model, what it, what it couldn't tell you about the content of emotions that we're then so inclined to dismiss what one another does, but actually, it's all real. And so if I could persuade you of one big theoretical thing, it, it would be to be promiscuous realists. It's all real. Do things suck? Yes, things suck. Because of the social problem? Yes, because of the social problem. Do you have a biological body where your neural states are making you feel awful? Yes. You have a real biological body that feels awful right now. Could it be helped by meds? Quite possibly. It might be helped by a good night's sleep or a good walk or someone actually saying something nice to you for once. Or who knows what it, what it might be helped by. But if you possibly can, it's all real. So don't, don't fall prey to those people who say this is real and what they do over there is not real. We have facts and what they do over there has no facts. If it's evidence-based, if it's measuring something that is uh, that can be measured by evidence, it's real. OK, thank you. Diatribe over. Um, so people disagree about how the role that emotions play in evolution and behavior, and they disagree about the role that emotions play in social order and control. So how much you're supposed to feel a particular way. So when I was the age of those of you who are students, it was in the early days of the GSS, the social survey, and people would say, you know, people who were new immigrants from, uh, for example, Eastern Europe and, and the former Soviet republics would say things like, why do they ask questions like, are you happy? Only idiots are happy. The, so the, the place that you come from is really impacts that, but also the role that emotions are supposed to play. If you live somewhere where the pursuit of happiness is one of the justifications for the version of meritocracy that we practice, like we do here in California, then the emotions are really important. Having that emotion is really important in social order and control. Where another person might think you're an idiot to be happy. Who could possibly be happy? The world is awful. How could you be happy? So um, people, again, vary in, in what they think it, that emotions, the role that they play in these. But specificity, empirical and theoretical specificity, is, is the key. Okay.
So there are age-old unsolved problems with emotions, and these are true across all the fields. You'll see it if you're a philosopher, you'll see it if you're a neuroscientist. What are emotions? Nobody really knows. Are they moods? Yes. Are they feelings? Yes. Are they sentiments? Yes. Are they urges? Yes. Um, how, how people define them varies. Um, are they universal? Um, it's a surprise. No one here that some people are splitters and some people are lumpers. So some people want to say there are these five root emotions that everybody feels and then everything else is a variation on a theme. And then some people who want to say there are so many variations on the theme that it's kind of meaningless to say there are these core, there are these core emotions. Um, I tend to think that there are some sort of basic things, but, but it, it actually not much hangs on that. Um, and then how emotions are related to reason goes back to antiquity, that question of is emotion what you do when you lose your reason, when you're beside yourself, when you're, when you're irrational? Is that what emotions are? Or are emotions the concomitant feeling, the thing that you have to have for reason to make any kind of narrative and causal sense? Um, probably all of the above. OK. So those are, those are problems across the field. But the, there are some, some classic problems in the social study of emotion that are getting a little closer to what I'm interested in tonight. Um, so theories of emotion, and there have been theories of emotion, uh, the social roles of, of emotion since antiquity. And sometimes reading that great old um, stuff, you, you come across these emotions that, gosh, I wish we had them today. I, was, I, I wish we still had them. There was one I was reading about yesterday, and it was called mildness. And mildness was that emotion when you calm yourself down and you feel that actually it is okay. I'm not actually going to lose it. The world is not actually going to end today. Mildness, that, that emotion of cultivating mildness. We don't have that anymore. We think of mildness as kind of weakness of will or someone who's not alpha. Um, but, you know, so, so the study of them and the role that that's played socially goes back a very, very long way. But the sociological study of emotion is only about 40 years old. Sociology started as um, a, a discipline being concerned with social problems. It tended to look more structurally um, and tended to be less interested in um, individual and psychological states. Um, but the, when, when sociologists ask questions about emotions, the kinds of questions they ask are, what role do emotions play in social behavior, um, social relations, and social stratification, so how we order ourselves. And social stratification means everything from who's popular and who's not, who's cool and who's not, to white supremacy. It, it's all of those kinds of nested hierarchies that we're all weirdly good at reading, even though most of us critique most of them. OK, um, people also ask what role emotions play in how social institutions function. So we all know how we're supposed to behave in a lecture. And if, we, if any of us, if I started or any of you started really not doing that, things would break down very, very quickly. And sort of comporting yourself in a certain way and not reflecting too much you know, disgust or anger to me as the speaker. It, we know those things and we know how to make the institution happen by regulating our emotion. And we know that we don't need a set of rules. Don't look too grumpy or Karis will feel sad. We, we don't need to write that. You know that if I'm looking at you, you need to not make me feel too sad. We, we, no one has to spell it out for us. And, and that's true for every, right through to the much bigger things about knowing how to look diligent, how to look engaged. There are things, there are things that we, we all know how to do. Um, and then people also ask about the role that emotions play in maintaining and contesting social and political order um, and things such as inequality. Inequality obviously is at historic highs at the moment and just been made a lot worse. Um, possibly long-term, possibly um, short-term, who knows? Um, but emotions play a big role in acceptance, in compliance, in being angry with, about, or normalizing or accepting social order. And again, what that often means is that you don't have to make the rules explicit, and it also often means that you don't have to enforce them by if someone doesn't do what you're supposed to do, you don't then have to hit them over the head with a club you just tell them, but in fact, you don't even need to tell them because they already know. So emotions play that really strong regulatory role. Okay. So 
social and political relevance of negative emotions. We have some really big crises going on right now. These are not surprising ones. You, you guys know them, you live them every day. Um, three of the biggest, three of the ones that people talk about all the time at the moment are this crisis of fact or truth or reason, this idea of being post-truth, that you can just stand up and say what you like and you might not be held to account, but certainly if you post something in social media, you'll get points of view from all over the map, so there's less of a sense of there being a shared standard of what, what constitutes facts, as well as many realms where people are actually paying attention to the fact that there is a contestation over whether or not what's being said there is fact-based. So you'll think vaccinations, climate change are heavily contested areas where um, people have been accused of denying facts. Um, merchants of doubt is Naomi Oreskes' expression for that. Um, and there's a lot of money on both sides. Okay, so what we get, but, but this cre it creeps, this kind of post-fact, this kind of it's all up to you, can creep in among us. Um, and we, that's why you've probably heard this word gaslighting constantly recently. You probably realize that everybody's talking about being gaslit in their relationships, being gaslit at work or at school. And gaslighting is that idea that, peop that, that your reality, you're nuts because your reality is taken out. Reality is taken out from underneath you. And even some of the most sustaining of our emotions, the most human of our emotions, like empathy, has a gaslighting tendency that people are talking about at the moment. So if I say to you, um, oh, I'm really sorry you feel bad, you're likely to be, I don't, it's not just that I feel bad, the thing that happened sucked. But right now, we, it's almost as if we can't say the thing that happened sucked. So all we can say is, I'm really sorry that you, you poor snowflake, or you, you poor person on the right who wants psychological safety, or on the left who's a snowflake, that you feel bad, instead of the thing that happened to you today, was, you know, you got barred from your class, or you overslept a Mr. Exam, or somebody else, everyone else got it a day early, and you, you know, whatever, I don't, I don't know what really goes on in your life, obviously, but, but we've, we've taken away, it, it creeps, and then we no longer have the basis for saying, you know what, the, you feel bad, and I feel really sorry for you because the thing that happened to you was really bad. We've, we're losing that at the moment. So losing reality, it has this really pernicious effect that people, and that's why you see the word gaslighting cropping up everywhere in the media at the moment. We also have this idea of, we also have this kind of meritocracy out of control. So when meritocracy was first raised as, as a concept, it was kind of an ironic, almost like a joke. It was kind of, the point was supposed to be that the people, no one was intrinsically that much better than anyone else and the playing field never was level. But somehow we've taken, we've, we've come to believe that a meritocratic elite, a people being very, very much luckier, very, very much better off than others, is okay if they earned it in some way. So we go to great lengths to make sure that the people who get a crack at the pie earned it. Um, this is, it's one of its iconic spaces at the moment is the moment is getting into college. So anybody who goes to UC Santa Barbara earned it. And you earned it starting so long ago. Um, you, you started, you did work, you did a certain kind of work and other people put you through certain classes and did, did a certain kind of work. So that even if you yourself don't feel as if you worked that hard, but you probably, or the, who, who feels as if you worked really, really hard to get here? Um, who feels as if the thing that you were doing took many, many years and many people were involved in it, including your parents or some adult caregiver? Yeah. So, and that's a complete change from a very, very short time ago when there was the school of benign neglect ruled in parenthood. But it's this, so this ubiquity of competition and evaluation, this idea that you're competing with your classmates so that you actually are, you know, you're supposed, you're only, only two people in your high school can get into Santa Barbara, so the rest of you are not going there, so you're actually competing with them constantly. For heaven's sake, even your Uber, even if you're driving Uber, you're being rated all the time. And if you're a passenger in an Uber, you're being evaluated all the time and given a score out of five. Everybody's probably seen the Black Mirror episode on this. Um, so this, this sense of the just complete ubiquity of constant competition and evaluation that just gets you down after a while. 
Um, and then the other one is this ubiquity of social media, this trolling that, again, you will have heard so much about. But anybody can say anything. And there's absolutely no accountability. And there's, and there's no real-time dynamics to it either. Um, you, 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 just, people, you say something, and then anyone can respond with anything. Okay, little picture. <laughs> okay. So negative emotions then in general have reached a kind of crisis level in today's political and technical culture. Um, I was just a couple of weekends ago at the first social science foo at Facebook, and it was a bunch of social scientists went to hang out with Facebook people. We have a, a sci fu that's a, that's a natural sciences thing that happens at Google once a year, and this was the first social science one to do with big data and things like that. And two of the problems that they're focusing on most in Facebook at the moment are this, are this threat to democracy and this affect of polarization. So, and it's precisely these phenomena, it's the phenomena of being post-truth, this constant competition and this trolling that together have led to this affect, what they mean by affective polarization is this idea that people are coming, representing really, really different points of view. So that if I say to you, I really like snowmobiles, you say, you like snow wiggles, but that's so bad for the environment, and that means that you're a little, 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 and we go off on this huge thing where you said one random thing, and then suddenly this entire script that shows that you are just the center of the universe and everyone else is awful, but it's on all sides, unfolds. So that, that's what, you know, that's the affect of polarization. There were, that political culture does it a lot and has historically done it, but it's tended to do it for, okay, abortion is going to be something that is something that will divide people. But right now it's so many things that there's almost nothing you can say without getting into that kind of um, arena. And then the other concern is this idea of the threat to democracy. So if extremes are amplified, if we lose the idea of having shared values, and if we lose the idea of facts and knowledge and evidence-based reality adjudicating, we really threaten um, the grounds for our democracy. Okay, so in some ways, we can think of our public sphere as being eviscerated. If we think of the three classic parts, logos, ethos, pathos, all that's left is pathos, politics by em emotion and power. We've given the, the steadying hand of reason, um, the logos, we've kind of given it over. We, we see it in automation, we see it in big data, but you know, again, with problems, uh, as people who are data scientists say, garbage in, garbage out. Um, and we've kind of, we've really given up using it in the public sphere to some extent. And we've also given up on ethos. We've given up on the idea that there are things that aren't just our personal emotions, but our shared values that we agree upon that we work to protect and promote. So if that means that the political sphere is just pathos, just emotion, we have a really big problem. Okay, so, um, so um, biomedical sciences, automation, we have some trends that are looking set at the moment to make things much worse before they get better. So one trend is that emotions are not distributed evenly. Only some people get to have some positive emotions or get to have them a lot. We also have um, biomedical trends that are increasing competition. So I talked about competition and evaluation as being one of the things that's driving the current moment. Um, so growth in selecting technologies. By selecting technologies, I mean what babies, you, what kinds of children you're going to have, how, um, how you augment yourself and your offspring to, to, to give each other the best possible life. Um, and those are looking, they're, they're really fitting into these ideas of naturalizing and normalizing ideas about worth, ideas about who's, who's a valuable person. And then automation, and I should say that I'm, I was the first woman member of the Oxford Artificial Intelligence Society back in the early 1980s. I love AI, I'm, I'm trained as a life scientist, I love the life sciences, I'm not, um, uh, none of what I'm saying is not against those fields, it's saying, how can we move through them in ways where we also use our social scientific and humanistic nous to make us navigate better in them? So automation is also forcing our hand. It's defining for us more and more with each passing month what emotions are. We're getting left with, it used to be that emotions were, were that, sorry, that artificial intelligence was more associated with intelligence. And now it's what can't be automated becoming more associated with emotions. I'll say more about that in a minute. 
Okay, so on the question of emotions not being distributed or, or attributed evenly, um, this is an era where Silicon Valley and global elites, think World Economic Forum, um, Silicon Valley, are all about the positive emotions. You can go, you can go and join seminars, in the, and these are usually the emotions. There's, these are the four big ones, mindfulness, gratitude, awe, and empathy. They're all about cultivating those emotions. Um, but at the same time, those with less to be grateful for are suffering persistent negative emotions and poor mental health due to racism, poverty, displacement, unemployment, incarceration, exhaustion, lack of health care, housing insecurity, and fear for their own and their children's safety. So we've got, we've, we, not everybody has the same crack at not everybody is supposed to be going and feeling awe. In fact, if you're a new immigrant, say, to a university and you're feeling too much awe, chances are you're not going to be a very good learner. But for a captain of industry, for a leader of Silicon Valley to go to the Redwoods on his bike and look at the Redwoods and feel awe is a good thing. So it's not the, the same emotions aren't the same for everybody. Um, and those of you who've recently applied to college, um, Students who aren't supposed to be getting into the top colleges are routinely expected to offer up their trauma, to offer up the bad, the negative emotions, the bad things that have happened to them as a way to show what extra things they went through to show their worthiness to be there in the first place. So there's a kind of sacrificial demand by others for the negative emotions of um, most of us. Um, and uh, we also see on, on college campuses a re-victimization of assault victims, of bullying victims, domestic violence, um, and so on and so forth. So very, very common patterns of re-victimization. Okay, and even mental health, which is closely related to emotions, to emotional well-being, is not distributed evenly. And I won't, I won't read these now, but you all understand that there are some people who, when they do things like shoot, here I just took shooting because it, it's in the news at the moment and one of the big walkouts, are a lot of big walkouts are tomorrow. Um, for some kinds of perpetrators, mental health is the go-to explanation for what's wrong. For other kinds of perpetrators, it's not an available explanation. And again, my point here is not to say who does and who doesn't have mental health or who is and who isn't a terrorist, but to say that the ascription and the availability of emotions is not distributed evenly. Okay. So, um, and in terms of the biomedical selecting society more, more generally, so this was the second thing that I was talking about, um, it's, we're living again in a moment where health disparities are absolutely rampant, even in countries with universal health care um, avail available for everybody. Um, costs are, uh, medicine has reached a point where its costs are such that uh, rationing is really significant, um, and health disparities are um, realities, even in places doing a better job than that we're currently doing in the US. Access to health care is highly stratified, um, and bodily privacy. Do people know what I mean by bodily privacy? The right to have a private life, the amount that you're going to be subject to surveillance, the way that you're going to be treated if you're pregnant, the way that you're going to be treated if you have a mental health or a substance abuse issue is really, really stratified. So in the biomedical realm, we very, very unevenly distribute things that are going to make you have a very high burden of negative emotions. So all of those phenomena that I just talked about are highly correlated with negative emotions and corresponding poor mental health. Okay, um, the coming together of genome editing, stem cell research, and sophisticated ARTs or assisted reproductive technologies are also exacerbating this. So we've got two big trends here. We've got a dividing of people into patients and then people who provide biomedical material for people who are patients, the haves and the have-nots of biomedicine globally. So we've got those people who serve as surrogates. We've got those people who are clinical trials participants. We've got those people who are kidney donors and other kinds of tissue 
um, and blood donors and things. And then on the other hand, we have the people who can travel, who can cross borders, who have that kind of cosmopolitan mobility to embody the traveling patient, the new kind of person who seeks the best of care by moving around to find the sources of that care. So we're seeing very, very big trends toward um, even who you are in terms of how you relate biomedically um, dividing people up. Um, and then we're seeing a rise, a massive rise, a precipitous rise in selecting technologies. Um, more and more kinds of human difference are being screened out through pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, therapeutic abortions, and um, soon coming to us all, human genome editing. Um, without a proper collective conversation about where or how to stop. Um, how many of you think that if you had a Down syndrome baby, you would abort? If you knew you were carrying a Down syndrome baby, you would abort. How many of you, does anyone in the audience have Down syndrome? Do, whether anyone in the audience has Down syndrome? Or does anybody have a family member with Down syndrome? Okay, so it, what we find, so the trend in, answer, in these things is that um, mostly people are not collecting this data. When I first began working with people doing these selecting technologies, it, people were doing quote unquote therapeutic abortions and using pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for deadly diseases, but there's what's called mission creep. And mo when I most recently talked to someone who I work a lot with in reproductive technologies in Europe, she was saying to me that um, it's now absolutely common to abort a fetus if you don't have a problem getting pregnant, to abort a fetus if there's an extra finger. So something that nobody would have thought of. Nobody's having the conversation and saying, ooh, if I have a baby with an extra finger, I'm going to abort them. But when it's offered, it's offered and we're in, a, in that culture where it's important to be a certain way and not another way because of the competitive advantage that it gives us, um, we find that people just end up saying, well, why wouldn't I just give my child the best in life? If it's not hard for me to get pregnant, why wouldn't I? Not that I'm that bad person, but just why wouldn't I? And we're not having those kinds of conversations to stop that. So mostly people want selecting technologies like genome editing for really good reasons. People are not just mean, evil eugenicists. They want to stop deadly, they want to eradicate deadly diseases. And really, really importantly, they want to stop people suffering who have serious diseases. Um, they also want to, they're also very often really cognizant of the poor services in inequalities in access and poor service available, both for people with disabilities and chronic diseases and for their caregivers. So these are, not, these are not reasons to be dismissed to say these are bad people. But on the other hand, when you talk to people, as I have done, they also very quickly talk about the possible benefits in living in a meritocracy of giving those children, giving yourself and your children the absolute best chance to do well in the system that's designed a particular way. And then it becomes a hop, skip, and a jump. It becomes so easy to start agreeing with selecting for intelligence selecting for looks and selecting for other highly valued traits. Again, not because people are bad people. And that's the mistake we make is we often think it's the good versus the bad people or it's pro-technology versus anti-technology. It's nothing to do with that. It's just that we have really good reasons for doing things and then we do bad things too because stuff happens and we don't stop and we don't implement better ways of dealing with it. So disability justice movements, health equity movements, civil rights and women's rights movements and initiatives for inclusive design have all drawn our attention to the constant competition and evaluation that increasingly drives parenthood, childhood and adolescence. Okay, so last of the diagnostic slides and then on to the strategies. So artificial intelligence and machine learning, again, the automation of everything, AI is extremely scientifically and technologically exciting at the moment, and it's completely redefining our human future. It's redefining warfare, well-being, the nature of work, possibly leading to technological unemployment that I'm sure you've all been talking and thinking about in your classes. Um, it used to be, as I was, had begun to mention a couple of slides back, you know, again, when I was your age, um, AI was theorized as, as what it lacked, what artificial intelligence lacked was intelligence, 
We thought of human intelligence being able to, for example, play Go. That's why for my generation, AlphaGo is so extraordinary because Go, unlike chess, was that thing that was not searchable. We didn't think you could go more than a couple of layers deep. We didn't think about deep learning. It wasn't a thing for us. So um, now in this era that we're in today, we, we think of AI as surpassing human intelligence and the things where we think of them as being human domains where we exhibit intelligence like chess, like math, people do not do them at an elite level without being completely symbiotic and prosthetic with their computing, uh, with their, with their um, automation and their computing technologies today. You couldn't, you wouldn't be, you'd be a very, very, very low level amateur if you didn't use that. So we've really changed what, we, what AI is. Um, and that's meant that people in, in Silicon Valley and the big, big um, employers, the people who are going to hire you guys, hopefully, are saying that they really, really value the human skills and they really value the emotions, they really value critical reasoning and thinking. Um, and it's true they do and these are really, really important. But what we have to make sure doesn't happen is what happens at Amazon Mechanical Turk. Who knows what Amazon Mechanical Turk is? So it's this site you go to if you want little gig jobs. It's a little, it's the kind of like the lowest of the low interface of the gig economy. It's where you get, you know, do, do these surveys and you'll get five cents for doing them or whatever. It's, it's kind of the detritus of the, of the gig economy. And it's the thing that, it, it's the jobs that can't, be motivate, that can't be automated. But the reason that they can't be automated, we're, we're being told is because they involve intimacy, they involve emotion work and things. But what we have to make sure doesn't happen is that they just are the jobs that don't get paid enough to get, mo to get automated. So we go on having people do those racialized, historically racialized, gendered, really low wage jobs that it isn't worth anyone in the big five paying for getting automated. Okay. Okay, these are many ways to classify emotions. What are the main negative emotions? I know you're going to disagree, but here's one try. The ang when you're feeling angry, hate, rage, righteousness, hostility, all the woeful ones, sadness, dejection, despair, grief, distress, all the super primal ones, fear, panic, alienation, loneliness, jealousy, disgust, all the ones around shame, self-consciousness and shame, anxiety, for the, the um, guilt, embarrassment, self-consciousness, insecurity, all the ones where you're on edge, where you just can't rest, you can't relax, you're not okay, you're beside yourself, anxiety, frustration, awaiting your fate, waiting to see if you got something, if you got in somewhere, if you succeeded in something, um, and then this sort of sense of irritation. All the ones around being worthless, belittlement, self-doubt, discrimination, imposter syndrome, um, and then all the, all the negative ones of feeling superior, people who are super judgy. I'm from living in Berkeley, so I know super judgy. Um, but, you know, people who are so certain they're right, people who center their own, their own moral universes and, and censor everyone else's, um, so, and contempt. Um, you know, those, uh, anyone want to throw anything else in or really object to anything in this classification system? Yes. Indignant. Is that negative? Is that a negative emotion? It feels good and righteous to me, but <laughs> thank you. I will remember that one. Okay, so another way we can think about it is think about the kinds of um, more the functional things, the ways that we're feeling around negative emotions. I love this one because of the penguins, of the fear of missing out. Obviously, a penguin's a penguin's a penguin, and it's a vast expanse of ice, so what looks like a group that that one's excluded from, if you go over there, probably doesn't. So I really like this particular picture, but um, anyway. So another way you could classify emotions is a kind of function, functional clustering of negative emotions. And if you read studies on youth today, so this is, this is your age group, but it's a little bit younger than you most. It's sort of middle school and high school students would be more typical for this group. I don't know if any of you are in that age range. Yeah, I'm seeing one person there. Um, so the fear of missing out is that, is that it's driven by envy and jealousy and, and a kind of anxious boredom and a kind of loneliness where you always in danger of feeling left out even if you're not really. Um, so it's not a restful kind of, it's not a rejuvenating solitude or a restful kind of boredom. 
it's something very anxious. Um, stress, which is huge for everybody and very measurable and a huge topic of study in psychology and neuroscience departments, um, which goes all the way from your basic needs not being met, housing insecurity, no food and so on, all the way to this kind of um, absolute, anybody who doesn't have disordered eating and disordered sleeping at the moment is not kind of living the dream. It's, you can't sit down and eat the way or sleep the way you're supposed to sleep and get into UC Santa Barbara. Some of you might be able to, but most of you can't. Um, and then embarrassment and shame, which is this, um, this pervasiveness of the threat of being called out. There's no way you can sort of rest. So you might be called out for just having said or done something wrong. Um, you might be bullied, harassed, trolled, judged, um, both online and in person. Um, all of these contain status anxiety, which we know is hugely important for youth. Um, and it's really, and that clusters around such things as perceived wealth, popularity, and then also things like what college you get into. For adults, we might talk about things about how we feel bad at work or um, you know, how we feel when we lose our jobs or these kinds of things. If we were really looking for those functional places where our negative emotions cluster. Okay, so there's some just being in their social media, um, being together alone. Okay, so turning now to, and I have no clock, so I don't know how I'm doing on time, but turning now to survival strategies. Um, so the first survival strategy I want to encourage is leaning in. So lean in is this, is this kind of heinous feminist concept that isn't really very feminist, which is if you're already incredibly rich, then get together with other women who are incredibly rich and support each other. Um, no, I'm being, I'm being sarcastic. Lean in is, is a powerful concept that's done a lot of good, but it isn't very cognizant, shall we say, of structural inequality. Um, but taking that expression of leaning in and thinking, and thinking about embracing some of our negative emotions, the key, though, is just to is to get the right ones to embrace and also to use them to do that political work. So to chuck them outside of that place they're sitting in your gut where they're making you feel sick and push them out there where there is a real political thing going on and this is actually a way to begin to mobilize. So we don't just want to overcome our negative emotions. So anger and disgust, they can be so well placed um, if they're expressions of justified political or personal outrage, they can animate action, they can be triggers to social justice. Um, so again, embrace them if that's what they are. Don't let them eat you, take them outside of yourself. Um, sadness and grief, again, they are negative emotions, but how wonderful and how underused are sadness and grief at the moment for living well in ways where we're honoring things. So honoring life, honoring love, honoring loss, the things where we, we need to feel sad, we need to have grief, and we, we're, so, we're so much it's pushing so hard for closure, we're pushing so hard to overcome our negative feelings, but how magnified is your mother's life if you lost her and you're sad as heck? How beautiful is the struggle you went through if someone broke up with you and doesn't like you very much anymore, but you know what, better to have loved and lost than not to have loved. Sometimes those things feel awful, but they're really good and we really need them and they make us live and they make us human again. They go against these very things that are making us trying to give us a false choice between a kind of what's left for the human if we don't take technology seriously or a completely technologized humanity. <coughs> Anxiety, shame, and self-doubt, they, they can be really good self-assessments. They can be really good assessments of others. If someone makes you feel embarrassed or makes you feel shame, maybe they're just a D dash dash K. Maybe they're just a bad person. Um, and, you know, it's really important to think about. I feel really embarrassed right now. Well, somebody behaved in such a way that, gosh, they just shouldn't have. And that's a, thinking about the assessment for that, for, for that person is really important. Or thinking about, I felt really ashamed then. And actually, it's okay. And one of the things that people sometimes do that can be incredibly effective is sit around and say that most embarrassing thing that happened to you and then guess what it's much less embarrassing because you've talked about it publicly 
Anyway, get wider social perspective, that perspective where you just embrace them and put them outside to honor life and love, to protest, to do social and political work, and to be okay with your flaws, with, with who you are, whatever, whatever, is, is a great, is one great strategy. And then the side, the little bonus you get for this, the little toy inside the cereal box is that studies have shown that people who think critically, people who do get angry and pissed off and who protest and things, other people perceive them as more intelligent. So that's a little payoff. Um, okay, so enough is enough. Righteous anger, all good. Well, not all good, don't let it eat you alive, but it has its place and the, the goal shouldn't be to not feel it. it it's, it's, an, it's an okay to feel, thing to feel. Okay, so here is one that um, requires us to do just a tiny bit of um, psychology, and it's something called FAE. So I'm saying be FAE evangelists. So FAE is, stands for the fundamental attribution error. And the fundamental attribution error, in short, is that thing where we think that pe we impute far too much intention far too much bad intention, take things, the way that we used to say it colloquially was we take things too personally. We impute too much intention to the other um, and, and we don't give enough of an account of the social and political circumstances. And the way that the fundamental attribution error really shows up is the difference between how we treat ourselves and how we treat others or treat those we love or those we're advocating for and how we treat others. So imagine that you're driving and you're really late for something and you're driving pretty fast and you're cutting corners and you nearly run down that poor pedestrian and someone screams and honks at you. Well, you were late. You were driving fast because you were late to pick up a dear friend or drop off a kid or something like that. Someone else does it and they're a terrible driver. They're an arrogant A-H-O-L-E. They're, they're something, you know, they are an awful person. It's, that's the fundamental attribution error. We don't stop to think, oh, that arrogant person, whatever, is also dropping off their kid, also is in a tremendous hurry, is also going to miss the train or, or whatever, whatever. We tend to give all the so social circumstances to ourselves and then we impute, impute um, characteristics to the person that then make us feel really, really bad. We feel really bad when someone is greedy, selfish, entitled around us. Okay, so every time someone does you or a loved one wrong, ask yourself, and it's amazing how often, how you just almost, the reason I use the word evangelist is you almost can't do this too much. Ask yourself, could they be ex um, responding to external circumstances? Could they ha be having a mental health crisis? Could they be suffering from structural oppression? Could they be blind to their own privilege? That might be their fault in some sense, but you know, if they don't see that they're doing something to you, at least it's not that they're intentionally doing it to you. Um, are they succumbing to, are they undergoing, are they themselves subject to a lot of political or other kinds of social pressure to behave in a particular way toward you? So tell others, again, be an evangelist, tell others about it, develop your practice, develop a practice of always imagining that that bad person was you and saying why they did what they did. So when someone gets you really upset, when you feel embarrassed or called out in a class, imagine yourself in the position of that student or that faculty member or that bad person who made you feel that bad thing and see if you can't tell a story where the reason that they did the thing they did means that it's nothing like as bad for you. Okay. Road rage. I come from England. We love our road rage. Um, literally once I was driving in pelting, pelting rain with about five feet of visibility in front of us with my headlights undipped and crawling along. And in England, of course, the mother country, a guy goes around in front of me, drives right in front of me, slams on his brakes so that I have to stop my car immediately, gets out of his car and starts kicking and punching and thumping on my window, on, my, on my, the bonnet of my car, on the wheels of the car, and screaming all the awful words you can think of for womankind at me because apparently I was driving too slow at two in the morning in the pelting rain with no street lights in the deep, dark countryside of England. We really care about our road rage. 
serious commitment. Okay, so this is gonna be the last of my survival strategies for tonight. And the reason I'm bringing up these three survival strategies rather than many possible others is because they are so common around the science and technology things that I was talking about, around the extreme competition, around the ideas of what's left to be human is to feel this kind of bad emotion. Okay, so the survival strategy number two, I've called it take kale with your Kool-Aid. It really is better for you. So Kool-Aid is something that we traffic in a lot when we're talking about positive emotions at the moment. Um, you're supposed to just get over things. You, you, know, you all know that if you want to work for Facebook or Google or Apple or whatever, that you're going to have to say that you're making the world a better place and every day is great and better than the last and embrace your inner nerd and you're going to have to be the most incredibly good sloganeers and take that Kool-Aid and keep believing it every single day after day after day and sometimes you just want to, you just don't want to do that. Um, so, and it, that's a problem. That, that idea that we're supposed to, that some kinds of people, especially the most successful in society, are supposed to always feel positive emotions. Um, some positive emotions that we're urged today to adopt seem to require that we just ignore power differences and dynamics, um, that we ignore facts, um, and that we ignore the profound inequality that those systems are producing and magnifying at the moment. So a lot of people report um, in those worlds, and again, I talk to a lot of these people in my research, um, that, that the feeling good that they're encouraged to feel all the time and the effort to make, every, make the world a better place and make everyone else feel good is somehow precarious. They suspect that it's predicated on a kind of blindness to a wider problem, <coughs> and that it's a blindness to a, to a pattern of well-being that doesn't feel quite right to them. They don't necessarily really embrace it, and they worry that someone else is feeling miserable at their expense. Um, so the, we might be happy, this is the way that people say it to me, we might be happy, but is our well-being dependent on others not being happy? And it's a kind of gnawing thing that goes with being, in those, being part of those elites. So the first thing that can be done, then, is be relational. Remember that emotions are relational. And a lot of the Kool-Aid ways we talk about positive emotions today, and you will see this in academic publications and all kinds of, of sites of work and so on, um, just forget the fact that emotions are relational. So you're often enjoined to feel gratitude. How many people have been told that it's good for you to feel gratitude? Does anyone ever talk to you about what you need to be grateful for? <laughs> That's good. So some people have people in their lives or they themselves, whatever, who are really, really good about this. But we have lost the relational term for a lot of our positive emotions. We've turned them into feelings that don't have a second part to them. So if you're not grateful for something, you can't think about you know, so then you, so when I talk to these people, I say, okay, so what are you grateful for? I'm grateful for my great job. What do you like about your job? It provides me with really exciting technical challenges every week. What else do you like about your job? I'm really well paid. What do you like about being really well paid? Well, I can afford this, that, and the other. And then they start to go into that place where, but I'm worried about gentrification, but I'm worried about all these people who can't do that, and I'm worried that we are making the problem worse. And that's where the inauthenticity of the emotion comes out because they're not following and they're not being enjoined to follow that other, that relational part of it. Think about the expression giving back. Uh, think, yeah, giving back. So think about philanthropy, the grip that philanthropy has on our imaginations at the moment. For really, again, super good reasons, public education is in crisis. The state pays for very, very little of what the UC spends to do the first rate science and and social science and humanities that they do in the global tertiary education scene for everyone around the world. So we're increasingly relying on private funds. Relying on private funds means that we valorize private funds and we valorize philanthropy. You will hear so many people say the right thing to do is to get rich and then give back. But what's the other, what are you giving back? Well, we usually use the expression give back when, when it's your mother or whoever it is telling you, give back what you took. Now, we may not be saying that philanthropy is giving back what you took. We might want to say it's giving back what you rightfully earned. 
but at least we have to ask what you're giving back. What are you giving back? There's public dollars that we got because of our ingeniousness or that we took because of our incredibly evil, inequitous and iniquitous um, economic system. If we ask, if we force ourselves to pay attention to, these, to the relational part of emotions, you can get to that place where you think about the harm as well as the good that they're doing. Okay. So, you know this card, you know this page of this book, Winnie the Pooh. Piglet noticed that even though he had a very small heart, it could hold a rather large amount of gratitude. Okay, so just to wrap up then. Um, the social, political, and relational forces that give rise to negative emotions contain the seeds of resistance to the current barrage of negativity. Certain aspects of the technological and biomedical worlds that we're living in at the moment, really ramping up the conditions for negative emotions, but they do also contain ways to, um, to resist them. I've proposed three strategies here that comes, comes from a, a much larger chapter where there's a much longer discussion and many more aspects of this, but lean into some negative emotions in some situations, practice working with that fundamental attribution error, working against it rather, practice thinking about people who make you feel bad, what might have caused them to do it. Um, and whenever you hear Kool-Aid, whenever you're told to experience disembodied positive emotions, have the kale too. Think about why it might feel precarious or inauthentic, whose expense it might be at, and how you can then relate to the great work you're doing in those places in a way where you don't rule out the possibility of thinking about those problems and thus solving those problems because the, social, the role of social, social order and social control that the positive emotions are performing makes you blind to them. Okay, so this work's drawn from my forthcoming book and thank you very much for your attention.